We're going to be in Acts chapter 11 this morning. We're going to be finishing up chapter 11 of the book of Acts. You know, last week as we studied the first part of chapter 11, we read about Peter and Peter returning, returning to Jerusalem to contend, it said, with the brethren. The brethren back in Jerusalem were a little concerned about what taking place over in Caesarea, see. They weren't uh, too pleased or thinking, is this, could this be? There had been Gentiles saved, Gentiles converted in Caesarea. And so Peter has to go back to Jerusalem, and he basically, the first part of chapter 11, recounts, recounts everything that took place. His vision in Joppa, the men coming to Joppa, taking him uh, to Caesarea, going to meet with Cornelius. Spending several days there. He he recounts all this stuff and how salvation had come to the Gentile. See, that was the important part. That was the part they were struggling with also. You know, the the Jewish people didn't didn't think the Gentiles were included in there. But God had different plans, right? Yes, he did. Peter had shared with these men of the circumcision, those Hebrew Jews back in Jerusalem. They called them the men of the circumcision about the falling of the Holy Spirit that had fell upon these believers of Caesarea, upon Gentiles of all things. How the Holy Spirit fell, and he said, the same as it did for us. You remember way back in the beginning of Acts, at Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit fell. Amazing things were taking place. This same thing happened upon these Gentiles. Peter told these men with no uncertain terms that this event was all of God. It was God. This falling of the Spirit was God. (coughs) Peter, I think, now was getting a vision. A vision for God's ultimate plan. You know, so many times we're we're way behind and where God's leading us and where God's taking us. And it's awesome when God will actually give you a little preview of where you're going before before you get there. Most of the time we're we're behind the ball on that. But he was getting, I believe, a a vision for God's ultimate plan. And he quoted, actually, the words of Jesus in verse 16. If you read verse 16, chapter 11, it says, Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John, indeed, baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he remembered what Jesus had said. I like the fact. And I made a big deal of that last week. Remembering the words of Christ. Remembering the words of God. Not verbatim, guys. You know, I'm a pastor. I still can't memorize Scripture. But memorize those important things that Jesus said. There's a Holy Spirit had fallen. Jesus says right there, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, last week I talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit just a little bit. I want to hit a little bit on that before we go into our Scriptures this morning. A little bit more in that. I I talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of water. Guys, it's two different baptisms. Two different baptisms. Jesus says it right there. You you know, John indeed baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That comes from God. That comes from Jesus. It's two different baptisms. You know, we're going to in a couple weeks, praise the Lord, have a baptism. Oh, by the way, there is a sign up for side dishes. Put your names down there if you're coming, and that way we know how much burgers and dogs and all that kind of stuff. So plan on being here. But anyway, next in a couple weeks, we're going to have a baptism by water. And that's basically publicly announcing yourself as setting yourself apart for Christ. It's setting yourself apart for Christ. And I, I like to take you into it because, you know, as we set this pool up here, and we got those surrounding it, and those witnessing that person being baptized and said, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus the rest of my life. Yes, I'm going to love Jesus. Are you ever going to sin again? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's not, let's not get that one out of there. Okay, but uh, my heart, I'm turning toward Jesus. And as those witnesses out there, man, in love, when a brother or a sister is walking in a bad direction, you go up to him and you say, you know what, man, I witnessed you. I witness you giving your life to Christ, more than giving your life to Christ, actually saying, I will follow Christ. You guys know that baptism isn't necessary for salvation, right? We all know that. That is not necessary, but it's something Jesus gave us. It's a wonderful thing. So there's a baptism by water, and then there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I mentioned that last week a little bit. And it's actually the following of the Holy Spirit. It's God bestowing on you spiritual gifts He has for you. 
Guys, it's God's power. It's totally biblical. And I'm going to read a few lists here. We're going to go through a few lists of where it says in the Bible, biblical lists of these gifts. It is for the church today. I want you to know it is for the church today. Don't get weird with it. Okay? If you're wondering, well, wait a minute. No, these are the gifts of God that He gives us. And many of you, I recognize these gifts in you, okay? And so I know they're not of you. <laughs> I know you didn't conjure them up, so they got to be from God, right? Romans chapter 12. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me to Romans. We're going to read one of the lists here. Chapter 12. Starting in verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Boy, that's the important part. God gives you a gift, use it, man. Use it. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it to our min in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I love mercy. So there in Romans 12, we see a list of prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, and like I say, mercy. Man, that gift of mercy. You can recognize that in a Christian really quick. Those that just have the gift of mercy, the gift of, of, of loving others despite, <laughs> despite ourselves, right? And then 1 Corinthians, if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 also. Verse 4, it says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Very important to recognize this, guys. It's the same Spirit that works in you, that works in me, that works in within all believers. There's a diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diver differences of ministry, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. I'm going to come back to that, by the way. For the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to the another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith, the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation in tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Guys, that is God. As God wills. He distributes them. So in 1 Corinthians, we see the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Those run really close together, by the way. Faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. We see all these gifts in that list also. If you, uh, while you're in chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, I hope you didn't leave there. Verse 28. It reads, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirds teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, variety of tongues. Here's another small list. Included in that is miracles, healings, helps. Oh man, I know there's some, I know there's some people in here, and I'm not going to pat them on the back. I'll never pat you on the back. That have that gift of helps. They're there to help people. They love people, and they're always going out there, and they're wanting to help people. In fact, they, they look for that. What a great gift to have. Maybe you have that gift. Maybe you're not using it. I don't know. Anyway, going back to Corinthians 12, 7. I told you I'd jump back here. These spiritual gifts are totally biblical, guys. They're totally biblical as long as you adhere to this. But the manifestation in verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It's not for you, by the way. If God has bestowed a gift of the Holy Spirit upon you, it is not for you. It is for others. It's for the profit of all, see? It's not, hey, I can heal. No, number one, you can't heal. God heals. I got this gift of this. It's not for you. It's for others. It's for the profit of all. Very important. Now, if you have any questions, if you have any questions about the spiritual gifts, come to me after service. I would love to speak about it. So in the end, going back to the book of Acts here, in the end, those in Jerusalem agreed with Peter. 
We've seen last week in, in chapter, first part of chapter 11 that the Gentiles were to be granted repentance of life, same as a Jew. And all that was necessary is the same that's necessary for us today and same that's necessary for the unbeliever out there, and that was to believe, right? Church, it's that simple. It's that simple to believe in Jesus Christ. With all that big prelude, we're going to go into the Scriptures. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You, Lord. Thank You for the the gifts of your spirit, Lord. I thank you for the gifts that I recognize in those in this body, God. God, that you would encourage them to use those gifts. God, you gave them that gift for a reason and so that it would be used. And it would be used to glorify you and to, help, and, and to be for others, Lord, for the profit of all, it says. But mainly, Lord, to glorify you. And so thank you for your spiritual gifts. And as we uh, go in this morning into the rest of Chapter 11, Jesus, that you would just give me, a, give me the gift of teaching, Lord. Lord, that I might uh, just preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 19, we're going to be getting in. The, the title of my message, by the way, is Got Purpose of Heart? You got purpose of heart, church? Question mark. You're going to see where that's going a little later here. Chapter 11, verse 19. Let's begin there. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to the, no one but the Jews only. But some of them, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number uh, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now what we see right here when Luke writes is a little flashback taking place. And it's a flashback taking place as to when uh, Stephen was killed. You remember back in chapter 7 it was actually, where Stephen was stoned to get death, and he was stoned to death by the Sanhedrin council. And you remember this is where we first saw Saul too. I remember the young man Saul, he was a young man at that time it said, and he held the coats and agreed to the stoning of Stephen. So he goes in a little flashback right here and, and um, he talks about these disciples. These disciples that had gotten out of Dodge. You remember back then the persecution came on quick. Stoning of Stephen, persecution against other Christians. They're getting out of Jerusalem. They're heading back to their hometowns. They're getting out of Jerusalem. Wherever that persecution is coming upon them, they're moving on. And so there's these certain disciples. It says they travel as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Now, Antioch was a large metropolitan city. It was a large metropolitan city, and it was 300 miles north, so quite a distance from Jerusalem. 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It was considered in the Roman Empire as being the third greatest of the cities under Rome and Alexandria. So it was an important place, Antioch was. And Antioch was known for its business and its commerce, where its location was. A lot of business went in through there and, and trading of goods and things of that nature. It was also known for its sophisticated culture, much like Wilhoit, you know. Its sophisticated culture, it was known for that. <laughs> <laughs> had to throw that in there. <laughs> I can't even spell that word. Little be it. <laughs> but also, it was greatly known for its immorality, guys. It was known for its immorality. A wicked city. A wicked city that was deeply seated in idol worship. In worshiping of other gods. Now, in verse 19, it says that those had went to this area, they only preached Jesus to the Jews. No one else, right? No one else, no Gentiles. I guess none had received yet that, you know, that vision that Peter had. I got, I got to say it one more time, I love it. Rise, kill and eat, Peter. <laughs> you know, I love that. Where he tells him, right, yeah, nobody had received that. And so they hadn't been preaching to the Jew Gentiles. But in verse 20, and there can be some confusion here, because in verse 20, it talks about some unnamed, those guys, they're unnamed, these disciples, they went to Cyprus, Serene, and when they had come to Antioch, it says they spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. They went there. Now, we remember back in Acts, and we remember how the Hellenist Jews, 
They had come to Jerusalem. And, when, and remember, that was part of with Stephen, too. They were complaining about their widows weren't being taken care of, getting the same provisions, that type of thing. These were Hellenist Jews. Hellenist, guys, is basically saying, you're from the Greek. You're from Greece. You have a, a, the Greek culture. You had adhered to their type of culture, their language, that type of thing. These guys were actually going back there, and they're speaking to Hellenist Gentiles. Okay, they weren't necessarily, you could say Hellenist, I'm a Hellenist, that meant there is Greek, I come from that area. They were speaking to the Gentiles. See, these disciples, they were going back to their hometown. They're going back to where they were from. They're going back to the land they were from. And when they returned, they preached Jesus. Now, they were used to hanging around these Gentiles. Antioch was full of them. Like I say, it was a wicked city. If they wanted to buy something at a market, guarantee them with there. They probably didn't invite them to their house. These Jews, you know, wouldn't have invited them to their house to eat. They didn't go to their house to eat, but they were used to being around them. They were used to being around these Gentiles, and they were used to being, uh, doing business with them, whatever it needed to be. So it wasn't unusual for them. They were from the area. And they started basically a Gentile outreach. A Gentile outreach just by simply speaking to them. See, Peter going to Cornelius, guys, that was a whole different thing. You remember Peter, he, back here in chapter 10, he went to Cornelius. Cornelius was already a God fear. He knew God. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't know about Jesus' uh, resurrection. He didn't know those things, but he was already a God fear. He was seeking God. These disciples, they went preaching to flat-out idolaters, pagans. Do you guys know any of those? <laughs> I don't know if you call them idolaters today. Maybe we just call them unbelievers. You know, the word heathen might come up. Well, they were preaching to the idolaters, these pagans. They had no true concept of God. And what did they do? They went there and preached hope. They preached hope in Jesus Christ. And it says right there that many came to believe. You know, sometimes as a church today, I think we miss the boat. I really do. I think we miss the boat. Always looking for some kind of unique and experiential way or some special way, some new exciting way to get the gospel out to people. You know, well, we got to have this. We got to have that. We got to have flyers. We have to have a big banner. We got to do this. Whatever it is, I think we miss the boat a lot of times. What we have is unique. Trust me. What we have is unique. Our relationship with Christ, it is unique, but it is also very simple. Church is a very simple gospel that we are to share. It's a simple truth, a simple saving message. It's a simple uh, hope, I want to say. It's a simple hope the Bible says is within us. The hope that is within us. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter writes, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and a fear. Now you got to start out, number one, is sanctify the Lord in your own hearts. Know Jesus, know God, know His Word. Sanctify Him in your own hearts. That He is the Lord of your life. That you're truly, when, you, when you're baptized, you're truly saying, I will follow Jesus. To have him within your own hearts. That's, that's the first thing. And then when those ask you for the reason, the hope that's in you, why are you the way you are? How can you be going through all these struggles and trials? And, you know, the kids are on taking off doing drugs and this and that. And, you know, your finances, I know you're, you're struggling financially and you still have the joy of the Lord in you. How, why is that? Why is that? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. <laughs> let me tell you about my Jesus, the hope that is within us. Sanctify the Lord in your heart first, guys. Knowing Jesus intimately, knowing God intimately, having faith, having hope, having trust, trusting God for everything. I know that's not easy to do. Trust me, I'm your pastor and I still struggle with that. Trusting God in everything, though. You can't sell what you don't have. Right? If you don't have that relationship yourself, how are you going to share it with somebody else? I said sell. How are you going to sell it to somebody else? 
By the way, we're not selling it. It's a free gift, right? Free gift. So these disciples, they went out to the people they knew in their homeland, to their little corner of the world, church. To their little corner of the world. To their little Will Hoyt. You know, we see amazing things happening all over the world where missionaries from those countries, their, 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 their um, nationality is from that country. They've left that country. They found God. They found a relationship with Christ, and they choose to go back to that country. And so, guys, some of those countries, they choose to go back to, praise these missionaries. They go back to Iran. They go back to Iraq. They go back into places that is not safe for Christians. Egypt. These kind of places. They're from that country. God puts on their heart, I'm going to go back to my home people. I'm going to go back to the people I knew. You know, some years past, Diane and I had an opportunity to go to the Philippines and spent several months there building a church for a young man. Uh, it was Calvary Chapel uh, Frontier was the name of the church over there. And he had planted a church, Anthony and his wife Bethany and their two little boys. And God gave them a vision and God uh, sent him as a missionary to go plant a church. Now, Anthony had no idea, or he, I said, it wasn't in his idea to ever just stay in the Philippines. He was to plant a church and then God would provide a Filipino, somebody from that land, to take over the church. So we go over there, and we're building the church and everything. And lo and behold, God brings this couple who live in California. They go to Calvary Chapel in Southern California. They were both born in San Fernando, the little town that we were building the church in. They were both born in San Fernando. Had lived in California for 25 years. Let me tell you what, man. You know, I love the Philippines, but, you know, America, there's nothing like it, guys. There's nothing like the United States. God puts on their hearts to go back to San Fernando and start a work, not even knowing that Anthony and Bethany were already starting a work. They meet up with Anthony and Bethany. Anthony and them, they stay there for a couple more years. He turns it over to John and Mary Lou, who are from there. They know the culture. They know the language. That's how God works. These guys were like that. They're going back to their, their hometown. Amazing how God orchestrates things. How God puts things together, guys. We try to do it on our own. You know, I think some of the churches in America feels like you need to go overseas. Okay? If you're going to go on the mission field, well, well, well we got to go to another country, right? I got to go to Haiti uh, and down to Mexico or Honduras. If I'm going to go in the mission field, I got to go to this other country, this foreign land. I don't believe so. Our greatest mission field is right here, right in our community. In fact, I'm thinking about on that exit door, putting up there, you are now entering your mission field because that's where it is. As soon as you leave this building, it is out there, church. That's our mission field. You know, and it says in verse 21, it said that the hand of the Lord was with them. Guys, when you go out, when you exit these doors, do you understand the hand of the Lord is with you? No matter what you do, the hand of the Lord was with them. Our Jesus is with us as we walk our, out. Our God is with us. He gives us the power to minister. When you're out there speaking the truth, just know you're not alone, okay? <laughs> just know you are not alone. The love of Jesus. Guys, it can be overwhelming. When you share it with those who have lost hope in life, the struggles of life, when you share it with them, that hope that is within you, and they see it in you, it can overwhelm people. It can overcome them. Literally overcome them. The simple conversations of these disciples caused a great number to, be believe, uh, to believe and to turn to the Lord. All they did was talk about Jesus. That's all they did. They had other conversations, I'm sure. When they had these conversations and then the opportunity arose, it just opened up. You know, sharing your witness is exactly that. You don't go there with the you know, Bible in hand and go over here and start reading Scripture to somebody. No! You ask them about their life. Ask them how their day's going. People love to talk about themselves, by the way. You ever notice that about me? <laughs> I could tell you stories all... Hours and hours of stories about myself. <laughs> uh, 
we got to move on, by the way. Verse 22. It says, Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Oh, here we go again, right? Here comes this news. Here comes this news. Back to Jerusalem. All the uh, men of the circumcision hear about this news. What is going on over in Antioch? You know, what's taking place there? Those in Jerusalem heard of it. And again, they were probably concerned. Is this true? Is, is what really taking place, is it true? Are they really turning to Christ? Is the gospel really being taught, and is it being taught correctly? All those things were concerned. So they send Barnabas. Oh, I love Barnabas. Guys, if you want to be, if you want to be like a character in the Bible, or a person in the Bible, be a Barnabas. Barnabas is a great man. And I'm going to tell you why a little bit about Barnabas. So anyway, they, they, they send Barnabas, and they send him to check out if everything's really true. They want to see if everything they're hearing is, is factual, right? And so they send him to survey the area. What's going on over here? What's going on in Antioch? What's taking place there? And they send him to survey it. He's basically checking on the missionaries, right? He's checking on those missionaries who ended up in Antioch. and That's an important thing, too. You know, as the churches send out a missionary, and, and they send somebody to, and especially when they go to a foreign land, boy, you got to go there and encourage them. you got to come alongside them. you got to send people over to keep them going because it can be rough. It can be really rough in these foreign countries. And um, Satan likes to have his way, basically. So they sent uh, Barnabas to survey. Barnabas was a trusting servant. He was a trusted servant of the Lord, and he listened to people. I guess I want to say that again. He listened to people. And he looked for the better, the best in people. Important trait that Barnabas had. He was actually, his nickname was uh, Son of Encouragement. That was his nickname, Son of Encouragement. What a cool nickname to have. He was an encourager. And he was one who wasn't looking for the limelight for himself. He wasn't looking to be on top. He wasn't that type of man at all. He had great spiritual discernment of what he heard. Like I say, he was a good listener. He wasn't quick to judge. You remember Barnabas, he was the one that took Saul from Damascus to Jerusalem to introduce him to some of the, uh, the apostles there, the disciples. He's the one who did that. Nobody else liked Saul, man. Nobody else was going to trust Saul. But Barnabas seen something in Saul, and he heard something in Saul, and he discerned it, see? He had spiritual discernment of Saul. He was one who looked for the best in other people. I love people like that. You know, it's really easy to be a discourager. Church, it's really easy to discourage people. Sadly, I see parents discourage their children of their dreams, of their hopes, of their desires. Well, you can never do that. And then you see other Christians discourage other Christians. Well, that's so silly. Why would you want to start a ministry like that? Discouragers are, they're a dime a dozen, but encouragers, oh, that's what you want to be. You want to be an encourager. Let me pray for you. If God's shown you that, it will take place. You encourage that person. And that's, and that's who Barnabas was. He was an encourager. I love those kind of people, man. Verse 23, we've got to move on. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. It says right there, he came and it says he saw the grace of God. It says he saw the grace of God, guys. How do you see grace? How do you see grace? What, is, what does grace of God look like, man? What does it really look like? Is God's grace physical? Is it some physical thing that you see? And people will actually see it? Yes, it is. I believe it totally is. The grace of God. Those who are covered by God's grace, those who, who portray, I want to say, God's grace in their lives, 
have a certain peace about them, church. They have a peace about them. They don't strive in things. It's not all about striving. How far can I get with this? They don't pretend. They don't pretend to be somebody they're not. This is who I am, man. That's the way God made me. You know? I realize I'm a little coarse in my language or something, you know? But the fact of the matter is, you see the grace in them. They're not trying to be something they're not. You can physically see it in them. They don't strive. They're grace-filled. They don't doubt either. You don't see doubt in these type of people. They have a peace and a confidence about them. As they, as they go through life, as they interact with the other people, they have a confidence in their life of the things of God. You know, like they say down under, no worries, mate. You know, they're those kind of people. No worries, mate. They have confidence. They have trust in God. Didn't get any response to my down under. Maybe that was a bad accident. I don't know. <laughs> God is in control. See, they realize that. And, and that grace shows in them. You know, guys, it's God's grace that gives us peace. Without God's grace, we have no peace. The Apostle Paul, in almost all of his letters, he would write it this way in the introduction. He would say, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord, Jesus Christ. There is no peace without grace. He would always put grace first. Grace to you and peace. Because that's where our peace comes from. I believe that the, 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 the grace of God is shown in our lives. It's shown through us. It should be shown through us. Put it that way. And it's shown mostly, and you may not like this, it's shown mostly when, you, when you're concerned about others more than yourself. That is when the grace of God is truly shown. It, is, it just shines out of a believer because you're more concerned about others than you are yourself. You know why? You know why you're able to do that? It gives you a great peace because you know that your needs will be met. See, so many people are striving for their own little niche in the world, their own place, their own finances and everything else. But when you put your mind and your heart upon others, knowing that your needs are going to be met, that is grace. That's the grace of God being shown in you. Guys, the non-believer should see grace in Christians. He should see the grace of God. It should be visible, just as, just as Barnabas saw this. So Barnabas encouraged these new believers. And he went there and it said, he said that he encouraged them to continue with purpose of heart. You got purpose of heart? He wanted them to continue with purpose of heart. What is purpose of heart? What is it to have purpose of heart? It's setting your heart and your mind beforehand. Purpose of heart is setting a setting of your mind, your thoughts, and your heart beforehand. If you read in the book of, uh, the book of Daniel, and writing in the beginning of the book of Daniel, and Daniel's a, ver a very young man, a, a teenager even, a very young, young child, and it says in there that Daniel purposed in his heart not to sin against God. Because as soon as he was there, they're trying to fatten him up with, you know, the meat of the king and all the luxuries of the king and the wine. But he said he purposed in his heart not to sin against God. He did it beforehand. He had that within his heart and in his mind beforehand. The purpose of your heart is setting your heart and mind beforehand. There's many things we can purpose in our heart, church. Many things. But the main thing we want to purpose in our heart is those things towards God. You, so you struggle with praying in the morning. You, know, you struggle with getting up and just you know, loving on God, loving on Jesus first thing in the morning. Purpose in your heart to pray beforehand. Already have it within your mind and your heart. I'm going to pray. You struggle with spending a little time in the Word. Purpose in your heart beforehand. I will do this. Fellowship. You struggle with making it to church. Fellowship in other ways. Purpose it in your heart. Purpose it in your heart. You have trouble with witnessing. Purpose in your heart when that opportunity arises. As you're out there and that opportunity arises to speak to somebody about Jesus, I am going to do this. This is purposing in your heart. You know, I was hoping 
some young people were going to be here today. Because it's so important. Well, sometimes they show up. It's so important for young people, especially their walk with the Lord as Christians. And man, I'll tell you what, the peer pressures and the things that are going on in this world. Talking to a young, young teenager the other day and asking her her dreams and she wants to be an attorney. I said, why would you want to do that? No, no, <laughs> I didn't do that. I said, all right, go for it, you know. Go for it. The, the, the big university she wanted to go to, I said, now, I don't know why you want to go there. I said, number one, I said, there's great liberality in all these universities and colleges. You know that these people are liberal and they're going to try to brainwash you. You need to purpose in your heart today that you will follow Jesus and all that other stuff. When they say, well, you need to be open-minded. No, you don't, church. We need to be closed-minded to that junk out there. We need to be closed-minded to that. We don't need to open our minds. We don't need to open our eyes to any of that junk out there for young people to purpose in their heart from the time they're young. I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to seek the Lord. Are they going to sin? Are they going to, you know, maybe be a prodigal child out there and do something stupid? Yeah, that's a good possibility. But they'll go back because you know what? They'll know where their help comes from. They'll know where their help comes from to purpose in their heart. Hmm. You know, it's kind of like getting a project started for you guys. Okay, you got a honeydew, right? You got a honeydew, and a lot of us have them. They're those honeydews. For me, the hardest thing about doing a project is getting it started. Once I start a project, bada bing, bada boom, I'll make it happen, you know? But it's getting it started. You got a purpose in your heart. Okay, I'm going to start this. <laughs> You know, for guys, you understand. Maybe you ladies don't. You just, just do it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, we need a purpose in our hearts to follow Jesus and not the ways of the world, church. Beforehand, the lures of the world. Following to temptation. Purpose much like Daniel. In your heart, not to fall to temptation. You know, there was a gentleman, uh, still is a gentleman, praise the Lord, he's a great brother in the Lord, struggled for years with alcohol, counseled with him for years. I really thought, man, these, this couple, they're getting divorced. She's, but she was an angel. She just kept bringing him back and bringing him back. And I said, dude, I told her to kick him to the curb. This is how bad it was. I said, you need to just kick this guy to the curb. But she didn't. Probably three, four years Counseling with this man. And one of the things I tell him, you know, and I understand, you know, I've had addictions. I understood where he was at. But I asked him one time, well, which way do you drive home? Well, he drives this way, you know, right by the liquor store and picks up his, all his beer and heads on home, right? I said, you need a purpose in your heart not to go that direction anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of ways home. Don't go that direction anymore. Like I say, praise the Lord. Satan doesn't have a grip on him anymore in that area in his life. And, you know, and his marriage is doing well. He's loving the Lord. He's serving God. Don't fall to the lures of the world, church. And it says in verse 24, because of Barnabas coming, a great many were added to the Lord. A great many. See, Barnabas, Barnabas was an upright straight shooting kind of guy. I love that about him. He was upright. He was straight shooting. He loved Jesus. And people recognized it in him. And they recognized his faith and his goodness, it says. I want to say that he was a man's man. He was a man's man in Jesus. He loved his Lord and he let people know it. He was a straight shooter. He loved the Lord. Period. Period. You know, so many, so many men out there believe that, you know, Christianity is weak. Oh, you got to be weak. No, I think, I think you're a true man's man when you know your God. And you know where you stand in relationship to your God, too. Makes a humble, a humble man. I know where I am before the Lord. I know where I am before my Jesus. I can't fill myself full of pride. He'll knock me down. Barnabas was a man's man. And like I say, he was a humble man. 
And he, all, he knew that he wasn't always the best man for the job. Boy, is that a good one to know. When you're not the best person for the job. He was, he was willing to step aside and let others lead. No matter how much work he was doing, he was willing to step aside. And he had gained, we're going to read here, he had gained a friend in Saul many years prior. You remember Saul? Saul's going to be coming into the ministry, man. Many years prior. Saul had been in Tarsus now 12 years. 12 years, guys. Things are moving on, but Saul's sitting in Tarsus still. He had gained this friend in him. Like I say, he was the one... Barnabas is the one who introduced the Saul to those in, in Jerusalem. No one else trusted him at the time, but, but Barnabas did. And Barnabas is feeling like that Saul is the man for the job. He's going to call him out of retirement, basically. Call him out of retirement. Now, I wonder, was it so much Barnabas' idea? It doesn't say here, but I'm almost thinking that God said, go get him. Go get Saul. I'm tired. It's time for him. Verse 25, let's move on. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Hey, there's where we got our name. All the way from Antioch, guys. Cool. Now, verse 25, it makes it sound like Barnabas just went to Tarsus, you know, and looked, got in the yellow pages, right, or the white pages, and he just looked up the address for Saul and found Saul, and went over and knocked on his door, and here we go, you know. No, that's not what it was at all. Not so. See, the word seek there in the original language suggests a, a laborious search. He had to hunt. Saul down, trying to find Saul. He spent his time to, doing it. Saul was so valuable to Barnabas that he was worth leaving, number one, what he, the work he was doing in Antioch, many coming to the Lord. It was worth leaving there. And at the same time, it was worth seeking out and searching out Saul. He was going to put the effort in. Like I say, it had been 12 years since Saul had gone back to Tarsus. And you remember as he um, went back to Tarsus, he got lowered down out of the Jerusalem in a basket and sent back there for his own protection. And no doubt as he's back in Tarsus for these 12 years, guys, that's a long time. Uh, maybe it's not for some of us older people, but 12 years pass really fast, doesn't it? 12 years. No, no doubt why he's there. He's ministering and speaking of Jesus. He might have even started his own small church. Might have started a church in Tarsus. We don't know. He was settled down in Tarsus, though. Probably had him some little crops growing there, house, making his tents, surviving there in Tarsus. Maybe thinking to himself, well, this is all it's ever going to be, you know? Thought things were going to go really big. But here I am in Tarsus. So as Barnabas gets there, and he actually had to do some convincing of Saul. He actually had to convince Saul to, to come with him to Antioch. It wasn't simply saying, come on, and Saul was ready to go. It says that he brought him. It means he had to convince him. Saul's time has now come. Saul's time had come, and he was going, God was going to use him. And he's going to use him as one of the greatest preachers the Bible has ever known, the world has ever known. After 12 years, sitting in his hometown, whatever he was doing, stitching up tents, I think. God was going to use him. Saul would be sent on many missionary journeys and plant numerous churches in the regions. He's going to be used mightily by God. Saul would suffer much. Saul would suffer much and be later known, of course, as the Apostle Paul. The writer of well over 80%, I think it is, of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he would be known as. His entire life would be devoted to the ministry. His purpose of heart, church, would be the ministry. Saul would be all in from this time on. Despite, despite the suffering that would take place. 
I love the cry of Saul. I call it his cry of life. You know, I can adopt this for myself, be honest with you. In a very humble way. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It was his purpose of heart. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, Paul says, but Jesus who lives in me. And everything I do is with the purpose of heart of glorifying God. Why had God waited so many years to raise Paul up? Why 12 years, guys? Why did he wait so many years? Why did Saul had to spend all this time in Tarsus ministering? That old town of Tarsus there, you know? In his hometown, preaching and serving in probably the smallest of ways, you know? Menial ways. Why? Because God was preparing Saul. Oh, Saul was a dynamic speaker. Saul was a uh, man filled with zeal. That was his natural abilities. I believe God was preparing Saul. He was preparing his heart in, in humility and serving in the smallest of ways. I think that's what he was doing. He was preparing Saul for the ministry in those 12 years. In the smallest ways. Guys, never look. Never look down on small beginnings. Say, oh, this is all I'm doing for the Lord. Never look down on small beginnings. Where God takes you from one place to the next. God prepares a man, prepares a woman. It's not like that. God prepares it. Sometimes over years. For myself, 20 years. 20 years. He prepares you. Never look down on small beginnings. Church, God can use anyone with a servant's heart and to do great, great things. It says in verse 26, as we wrap up here, they were first called Christians in Antioch. <laughs> you know, by the way, that name was probably used to mock them. Originally, it was probably used to mock them, but just like us today, we like it. I like it. Call me a Christian. Call me a Jesus freak. I don't care. Yeah, really? Really? You think that? I'm a Jesus freak? All right. Good. Yeah. Call them Christians. You know, the Latin ending of I-A-N meant the party of. It meant the party of, of the party of Jesus, Jesus' people. That's what Christians are. You know, they say, well, followers of Christ, yeah, that too. We're Jesus' people. We're the party of Jesus. In verse 27, let's finish up. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. They also did and sent to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Good old Barnabas again. I love that guy. With this growing newfound faith they had, guys, as Christians, they were now called Christians in Antioch. With this growing newfound faith, they also came the words and the deeds, the works of Jesus. You understand that? With the name came the words and the works of Jesus. Caring for others. Caring for others out there. Taking care of the brethren. Giving of what they had for the body. That was the works of... That was not normal for them. That's not normal for anybody. That's what Christianity does within. You care about other people. At least you should. You should care about other people. Caring and taking care of them. This act of helping others, by the way, guys... And you think about it in Christianity, around the world, do you realize that the church, church, when I'm saying worldwide, is the greatest relief 
of natural disasters in our world. If there's a natural disaster, there's church there, guaranteed. And they normally outgive the governments, these governments that have billions of dollars, they will give them 20-fold. And they stay there. They stay there too. Still missionaries, still people helping out in Haiti. Still people helping out in these different areas. They stay there. It's more than just money, it's their heart. This act of helping others around the world, that is Christianity. And the church has always stepped up to the plate in the times of need. And especially, especially with the body, the body of Christ. Now, basically, the church doesn't, you know, they're going to help, the, well, we'll call it the Gentile or, or the Christian alike, the non-believer or the Christian alike. But there's a biblical reference of helping your own. It's in Galatians 6.10. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. They were going to help out their brethren. And not only did it say they thought about it, they determined to send it, they purposed in their heart this relief. Not only did they think about it, but they also did it, church. <laughs> There's a big difference there. There's a big difference of just saying, well, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about this and actually doing it. They actually did it. They purposed it in their heart. This is what's going to take place. And then they did it. And a lot of people have good intentions. Praise the Lord. Good intentions don't get you anywhere, really. A lot of people have good intentions. But those who purpose in their heart will act on those intentions, church. And that's in everything. If that's your relationship in the Lord, when you purpose in your heart, I want to draw closer to Christ. You know, I think that's what that baptism is for some. They're purposing in their heart. They want to draw closer to Christ and they want you to be a witness of it. That's a cool thing, man. You got purpose in your heart, church? If not, let's get it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again. Thank you for your words, Lord. God, purpose in our heart. Give us the power of your spirit that we may purpose in our heart, Lord, to... God, seek all that you have for us. God, that we would be children of the risen Lord. By the way, Lord, not ashamed of it a bit. Call me a Jesus freak. I love it. God, there's a whole bunch of us around. So God, I just pray your blessing upon the body of Christ. God, let us purpose in heart purpose and heart to love you in a greater way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.